Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome uh, to the Banyan Tree Leadership Forum uh, here at CSIS. I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the senior director. Uh, I'm, actually, I'm not the senior director. I'm the senior advisor <laughs> and the director of the Southeast Asia program here at CSIS. And it is, uh, it is a rare pleasure this morning to be able to uh, introduce a, a very good friend who is also uh, one of the um, most important leaders in terms of uh, foreign policy and foreign policy developments in, uh, in Asia today, and that is the new Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of the Philippines, Albert Del Rosario. He is uh, a man who uh, is, is a truly uh, a sort of a renaissance man. He's a leader uh, in his country of the business sector, of the social sector, and he has uh, given his uh, time and, and energy to the public sector. Um, he was uh, CEO of, uh, of many companies, uh, the chairman of, uh, of a think tank, uh, Stratbase. He um, uh, was ambassador to the United States and, uh, and went back into private practice uh, after that. And he was called by uh, President Aquino uh, to become the new uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs. And when that happened, I knew that the Philippines was going to, uh, to move up uh, to another level of uh, engagement in terms of, uh, of the region and in ASEAN and Asia Pacific and also globally. And I also thought this will be a special time for the U.S.-Philippine relationship. And indeed, uh, it only took <laughs> uh, days in office uh, before that, those things started to happen. Uh, this is a this is a man who uh, has made great uh, bounds forward in the U.S.-Philippine relationship as ambassador, and I think it'll be very interesting to see what he will do as uh, foreign secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to uh, take any more time. I'm really looking forward to this uh, this presentation this morning myself. I hope you'll join me in welcoming our speaker today, uh, Albert Del Rosario, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. Thank you, Ernie, for the uh, generous introduction and the very warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it is um, good to be back in Washington, D.C. As a visitor now, after having been in residence here from 2001 to 2006, when I left Washington, D.C. in 2006, the country was in the midst of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the government had just announced its plan to renew ties with Libya. China was criticizing the U.S. for overreacting to North Korea's launching of missiles, and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld stepped down that year to be replaced by a former CIA head. I returned to a Washington, D.C. well on its way to bringing home its troops from Iraq and Afghanistan. The Arab Spring has redrawn the diplomatic map of the U.S. relations with the Middle East, and we are hearing the very significant results of the U.S. engagement with China on the strategic level. Coincidentally, Another CIA chief is set to become the Secretary of Defense. Our country and our people have undergone a sea of change in that time. President Benigno S. Aquino III, son of the two of the Philippines' democratic icons, was swept into the presidency with the undisputed mandate of the Filipino people. When he assumed the presidency, he stated that our foremost duty is to lift the nation from poverty through honest and effective governance. In pursuit of this commitment, he has entered into a social contract with the Filipino people 
and set out an agenda for national development and good governance. This social contract underspins the three pillars which will continue to define the course of our foreign relations. Promoting national security, enhancing economic diplomacy, and protecting the rights and welfare of Filipinos overseas. Anchored on these three pillars, we have crafted a foreign policy that is focused and deliberate. A foreign policy that advances our domestic interests, fully cognizant of our commitment to our core values and our responsibilities to the region and the world. Economic diplomacy is a is among our most important tools in achieving the twin goals of poverty alleviation and job creation. And my department will be more aggressive in engaging with our traditional economic and commercial partners. Yet, we are aware that the success of our economic diplomacy relies on our capacity to create a good investment climate in the country, both internally and externally. Within the country, we are taking the necessary measures to build an economy anchored on transparent, stable, and predictable policies that create a domestic condition attractive to foreign investors. To address the concerns of investors, we have initiated a public-private partnership program that will modernize our infrastructure. We have also fostered the conditions for peace particularly in the southern parts of the Philippines. Externally, we continue to develop stronger bilateral, stronger bilateral relations and pursue co cooperation with our multilateral partners to build a safe and secure environment, not only within the bounds of our territory, but also regionally and globally. ASEAN continues to be a cornerstone in this endeavor as it moves closer to building an ASEAN community by 2015. We will also build upon our strong defense partnership with the United States and will engage China, India, India Japan, and other regional partners such as the Republic of Korea, Australia, and New Zealand in mutually beneficial security and defense dialogues. We're also stepping up our cooperation and interaction with the countries in the Middle East and North of Africa and the organization of the Islamic Conference in resolving the Mindanao conflict. As we work on creating more jobs at home, we remain mindful of the President's call to be even more responsive to the needs and welfare of our overseas Filipino workers. We will continue to do what is necessary to send the clearest signal that the Philippine government cares for its people wherever they are. Protecting the rights and promoting the welfare of OFWs will continue to be a strong pillar of our foreign policy. So how does the Philippine-US alliance figure in our foreign policy? When I served as Philippine ambassador to the United States, my worldview put the U.S.-Philippines alliance at the center of the universe. Coming back, wearing a different hat, I am constrained to make adjustments to that perspective. To be sure, the United States remains the Philippines' foremost strategic ally. Our relations are enduring, cemented by the sacrifice of those who fought side by side in defense of our common ideals. The United States is one of the Philippines' top two trading partners. Two-way U.S. merchandise trade with the U.S. was at $15.4 billion in 2010, and 11% of our imports are sourced from the United States. On the other hand, 15% of our exports find its way to the American market. With our population of over 90 million people, we are the U.S. 30th largest export market. The U.S. is also important to the Philippines in terms of official development assistance. Since 2004, 
the government received close to one billion U.S. dollars in grant funds for various programs to support economic growth and alleviate poverty, strengthen democratic institutions and governance, and counter transnational terrorism and insurgency in Mindanao. Strong people-to-people -people ties strengthen the fabric of our relations. The 2010 census indicates that some 2.5 Filipi million Filipinos live in the United States. The U.S. Embassy in Manila, on the other hand, estimates that some 300,000 Americans make their home in the Philippines. Our common commitment to the ideals of democracy provides another underlying thread that fortifies the fabric of our relations. Despite the network of old and new relations, the U.S. has established in the region, it is difficult to imagine any other country who will share as closely with the, US, with, with the U.S. the same set of core values and beliefs as the Philippines, and is as committed to the defense and pursuit of these values. Thus, for many years, the Philippines and the United States have soldiered on, confident in the strength of our alliance. Yet, the global and regional environment on which we built our alliance did not stand still. It has developed in ways we did not and could not imagine in the 1940s or even when the Cold War ended. The new global and regional architecture de demands of each country an introspective assessment of how it relates to the rest of the world. In the post-2011 world, for example, security relations between the Philippines and the United States have been focused heavily on counterterrorism cooperation, and this cooperation has undoubtedly borne much fruit for both countries. But the Philippines' relative, relative success in counterinsurgency coupled with pressures in the regional environment, compels a reorientation of focus and resources. On the other side of the Pacific, we observe the U.S. renewing its engagement with Asia in very substantive ways, after what has been perceived as a long preoccupation with the Middle East. We also see that fiscal pressures may impact certain aspects of U.S. defense and foreign policies, requiring policymakers to explore new and creative ways of doing more for less at a time of growing challenges in various parts of the world. The recent slump in the global economy has taught both our countries invaluable lessons, and the intense competition for markets and resources are cause for common concern. In an increasingly interdependent global economy, we need to ensure we are well positioned to, to leverage our relations to produce more trade, more employment, and generally a better life for our people. A reset in the relations has therefore become an imperative to allow the alliance to continue to meet domestic goals while contributing to global stability. The intersection between our respective domestic imperatives and the current regional and global challenges indicate a momentum for a mutually beneficial cal recalibration and reset of Philippine-U.S. bilateral relations. We welcome the pronouncements made by the United States on their renewed engagement with Asia and on the importance of relations with the treaty allies. Allow me to share with you our own vision for the United States' continued presence in Asia. The U.S. presence in Asia has been long-standing, and we want it to endure. We want it to be premised on a deep-seated recognition of the U.S. role as an Asia-Pacific power, rather than a reaction to perceived challenges to its global leadership. We want the U.S. presence in Asia to build cooperation, rather than it being misconstrued as fermenting divisions. We believe that Asia is in the midst of unprecedented growth and the most serious of challenges. We believe we can best harness 
these opportunities for growth and address the challenges with unity of purpose, underpinned by strong rules based on international system. We recognize the potential of the Alliance to be an enabler for the growth of the region in terms of security, the economy, and people-to-people -people connections. In our current role as country coordinator for ASEAN-US dialogue relations, we are committed to help the US secure its equitable place in the ASEAN-centered regional architecture. We believe this is also the time to recast the model of our security engagement. The military tenets of the Cold War are no longer valid, and the physical presence of military bases is no longer the foundation of a robust security arrangement. To be clear, we do not expect the U.S. to fight our battles for us. But we count on the U.S. strong and unwavering assistance in building the strength and resources of the Philippine military to meet the new challenges. To this end, we are exploring novel and innovative ways to strengthen the security engagement in ways that will address the challenges but respect the constraint of each other's domestic environment. The Philippines is well aware that the alliance is only as strong as the commitment and resources with both, which both countries are prepared to commit for the pursuit of our common goals. On our part, the Philippines is prepared to step up to our responsibilities to contribute to the security and stability of the region, first and foremost, by being able to secure and protect our own territory. Our defense establishment is thus working to improve our capabilities to police and patrol our own maritime domain. The campaign against tra transnational crime, including piracy, drug trafficking, and human trafficking is also being sustained. We're prepared to take our place in the global supply chain, leveraging the skills and talents of our people and showcasing an economy where everything works. We resolve to create the best possible environment for business to thrive, free from corruption. We will also continue to explore opportunities for mutually benefit, beneficial economic linkages, such as the Save Our Industries Act, which Senator Daniel Inouye refiled yesterday at the U.S. Senate. The new model should also embrace a development dimension. The Partnership for Growth is a joint undertaking between the Philippines and the United States, whose principal aim is to unlock the Philippines' potential for a broad-based and sustained economic growth. As the only pilot country in Asia, the Philippines was selected on the basis of its track record in partnering with the U.S. government and potential for continued economic growth. We are prepared to assume a more active role in crafting the policy environment of the region and in building stronger networks of cooperation among regional powers through bilateral arrangements and through the mechanisms of ASEAN. We intend to lend our voice and the force of our convictions to the issues that define us the protection and promotion of the rights of our citizens, the establishment of the institutions of democracy, and the peaceful settlement of disputes. A few weeks ago, I have advocated for the pursuit and promotion of a rules-based international system which will provide an effective tool for peaceful and fair resolution of disputes. Not since the Panganiban mischief reef incident in 1995 has the Philippines faced serious challenges in the West Philippine Sea, otherwise known as the South China Sea. For instance, our ownership of the Kalayaan Island Group features and our legitimate maritime jurisdictions have been contested by certain nations, even as the Philippine sovereignty and jurisdiction over the Kalayaan Island Group are firmly grounded on international law. The primacy of international law, particularly the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, is the cornerstone on which we define and protect our territory and maritime entitlements in the South China Sea. 
It is this principle and the requirements of UNCLOS that govern the passage in 2009 of the Philippine Archipelagic Baselines Law. It is also the same principles that underpin the two vital pieces of proposed legislation defining our maritime zones and archipelagic sea lanes. In the same manner, we are fully committed to the spirit and letter of the 2002 Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea between ASEAN and China, and will utilize all diplomatic means at our disposal to work for a binding regional code of conduct. To reinforce this goal, we offered a framework that transforms the South China Sea from an area of dispute to a zone of peace, freedom, friendship, and cooperation. By a segregation of disputed relevant features from the undisputed waters of the South China Sea, consistent with UNCLOS. In the words of President Aquino, ZOPFFC, which is Zone of Peace, Freedom, Friendship, and Cooperation, is a modality for ensuring that what is ours is ours, and that what is disputed, we're willing to work towards joint cooperation. There should be no room for discourse on what are clearly internal waters. The disputed features, on the other hand, can be just transformed into a joint cooperation area for joint development and the establishment of a marine protected area for biodiversity con conservation under the zone of peace, freedom, friendship, and cooperation. We are confident that ZOFIC represents an important contribution to securing peace, stability, and progress in the South China Sea within a rule of law framework and that the concept deserves serious and favorable consideration by countries with, st with stakes in the South China Sea. The Philippines' policy in the South China Sea, both with respect to securing its terrestri terrestrial and maritime domain and to advocating dispute resolution and joint cooperation where applicable, is grounded on unwavering adherence to international law. Since international law must be observed, it behooves the Philippines to embrace this imperative to the fullest. Ladies and gentlemen, the immutable forces of, geog of geography have predestined for our countries a shared history. But it is the choices we have made through the, through the years that has allowed our relations to evolve and to endure. As we stand at important crossroads, we are called upon again to reshape our engagement in a way that will allow it to meet our mutual needs and grow beyond our expectations. I firmly believe in the strength of our alliance and more so in the dynamism of the ties that bind us. By the grace of God and with the determination of our governments and people, I'm confident that we can provide a new impetus to our relations which will pro propel us towards our shared aspirations for peace, prosperity, and progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I would like to uh, welcome uh, all parties to, uh, to ask questions. Uh, the only <coughs> rules, uh, as usual, uh, are that uh, we ask you to just uh, mention your name and your affiliation. And, uh, and please ask questions, not, uh, uh, not make a statement, if you, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, with Chris in the front. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Chris Nelson of the Nelson Report. Thank you, sir, for a very far-ranging speech. And as somebody who writes every day about both trade and uh, Paul Mill, thank you for talking so much about uh, the economic side of your job. Uh, uh, at least we'd ask two questions. Uh, uh, where are you in looking at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, that is uh, certainly currently the central U.S. Uh, engagement uh, uh, in uh, the Pacific? Uh, an Asian region, if you could share with us some of your thoughts on how that 
that's going how you would like to see the if you would like to see the Philippines uh, more deeply involved. And you spent a great deal of the end of your speech, of course, on the South China Sea. Uh, you probably know that Ernie sponsored a just terrific, although terrifically depressing, conference uh, uh, Monday and Tuesday right in this room, uh, and which leads to this question: um, In listening to our Chinese friends, uh, they flatly stated that China uh, ex has sovereignty over the South China Sea, not our part of, but the, all of it, and that everything China is doing is uh, uh, legal uh, defense of that sovereignty. In your dealings with the Chinese and what you've heard from them, are there any areas of the South China Sea that they concede are actually Philippine resources, or are they talking to you mainly about sharing your resources uh, while safeguarding theirs? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership is, a, uh, is an initiative uh, that's uh, currently shared by uh, nine countries. Uh, this is the original group. And uh, it is uh, intended to uh, develop into a, uh, an area FTA. Uh, that group uh, has considered itself as a close group as far as the first phase of that program is concerned. Uh, the Philippines is, uh, is very much interested in uh, in being a part of this, uh, but I think uh, we have been relegated uh, to, uh, to be part of the second group. And to the extent that we're preparing for that, uh, we, are, uh, <clears throat> we have been offered by the United States a, a program uh, inclusion uh, which involves only four countries, one country of which is uh, from Asia, that being the Philippines, on this uh, partnership for growth. This is, the, uh, this is an initiative of, uh, of the United States, of the White House actually, in order to be able to provide a uh, broad-based economic growth for the Philippines. Uh, essentially, the program is, uh, as I said, for four countries, and it's directed towards uh, looking at uh, constraints uh, to, uh, to moving forward, and it's also uh, very much into uh, encouraging and looking for ways to uh, foster revenue generation. So this is uh, the pre preparatory stage, I think, for being part of Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Yes, we're very interested in being a part of that. And uh, yes, uh, we are working with the United States and are, are grateful uh, for this accommodation, where 15 of the uh, US departments will actually work in terms of, uh, of trying to unleash the full potential of our economy. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, your question is, uh, if, if we were to look at the China claims on the South China Sea, is there a uh, room for anybody to have jurisdiction over anything? The answer is no. There is no room. Because uh, China has uh, two concepts. One is the, uh, is the uh, nine dash line. Uh, on the basis of uh, a historical record, they say that uh, the nine dash line concept uh, provides a total sovereignty for China on the entire South China Sea. Uh, their second concept is their Nansha concept, uh, which states that uh, the uh, Spratlys uh, is, is, uh, belongs to them, that it, they have full jurisdiction of that as well. Uh, yes. Mr. Secretary, Gene Martin with Asia Pacific Strategies. Um, I like your idea of stronger regional networks uh, dealing with the South China Sea. Do you see any opportunity, any chance that the overlapping, conflicting claims for parts of the South China Sea would prompt those countries who have claims to join together to try to um, negotiate with the Chinese. I know the Chinese have always said bilateral negotiations, not multilateral. Mm -hmm. But since even bilateral negotiation would not resolve the overlapping claims, mm -hmm. perhaps a multilateral would be approach <coughs> would be helpful among the ASEAN nations. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, uh, the claimant countries, uh, if you exclude China, uh, would uh, reasonably look at uh, international law as a basis for determining the, the, uh, the legitimacy of their claim. 
and uh, if uh, if if we're able to sell that idea that uh, uh, international law uh, should prevail, uh, particularly the UNCLOS, uh, then we would be able to establish the legitimate claims. And the the proposal that the Philippines is making is that uh, uh, the the disputed areas. Uh, after you determine uh, legally uh, who claims what, uh, you're left with the disputed areas. Those areas, uh, we believe, uh, should be open for consideration in terms of uh, joint development. Tiger Zhang from the Stimson Center. Uh, I noticed your underpinning of the idea of uh, ASEAN centrality in regional development. However, the current uh, uh, regional integration regime is built, it was, was built in a time when the U.S. Um, force was lacking in this area, either geopolitically and economically. I mean, at least it was far less focused than today. So given today's situation where the U United States is coming back uh, with much larger engagement in this area. Uh, why do we have to st still stick to ASEAN centrality? Thank you very much. Well, you know, I, I think that uh, we, are, uh, we are building a, uh, a community uh, among 10 countries in ASEAN. And uh, ASEAN, uh, by the way, is the bedrock of our foreign policy. Uh, we believe that uh, ASEAN uh, is, is, uh, is a growth opportunity uh, in, in our region, and we believe that uh, it, it has a political dynamism in itself. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the centrality uh, question is, uh, uh, if you want to do business with us, uh, you have to allow us to set the agenda. That's what centrality is, is all about. Uh, uh, for example, I think you're referring to uh, if if you're referring to a a, a forum, an international, a regional forum that the U.S. is effectively uh, uh, belonging to or about to belong to. You might be referring to the East Asian Summit. The East Asian Summit is uh, is, is strategic. It is uh, leaders led, and uh, the next uh, uh, East Asian Summit will actually include. Uh, the U.S. and Russia for the first time. So President Obama will, will, will be coming uh, to attend that meeting. And uh, the, the, uh, the centrality of, uh, of ASEAN is, uh, is we do have a, an agenda. Uh, but with the entry of uh, Russia and the United States, uh, we have felt that uh, it was uh, appropriate uh, to open that agenda to include other issues uh, that are of interest uh, globally, and and to that uh, to that extent, uh, the original agenda for uh, for the EAS as driven by uh, by ASEAN uh, was uh, was uh, uh, economic, uh, energy, uh, education, uh, uh, pandemic, and uh, disaster management. And uh, the, the U.S. felt that uh, the discussion should be extended to, uh, to political and security issues, and we agreed with that. And so that will prevail. Oh. Uh, I'm Mitzi Picard. Picard of Asia Society. Um, thank you very much for your comments, Secretary Del Rosario. I have two short questions. You mentioned the strong strategic relations between the Philippines and the U.S. Uh, in regards to Osama bin Laden's death, how do you think um, these defense or strategic relations have been affected? Has the Abu Sayyaf been weakened? And how will this look towards the Balikatan exercises in the future? My second question is the SAVED Act. Um, we have, there's a short time frame for it to get passed in U.S. Congress. What is your strategy in regards to getting the SAVED Act passed? Will you be going through ASEAN also as an um, ally th for the SAVED Act? Thank you. Um, I think the, uh, the, uh, the strategy for, uh, for focusing on the, the Abu Sayyaf uh, I think they have been uh, 
degraded. Uh, they used to number about 1,200. According to the military, they're down to 200. And uh, we believe that uh, what's become uh, of uh, greater import is the need to, to, uh, to develop and refocus on our territorial defense. And uh, at the time when we were dealing with uh, the Abu Sayyaf, when they were a significant force, uh, the, the police force uh, did not have the capability to, to address uh, that issue. And so we had the military turn to them and to help out. At the end of the day, it was the military carrying the ball, and, uh, and uh, we, f we feel that that uh, situation should now be corrected. Uh, I, I believe that the police uh, is going to be able to, uh, to, uh, to handle the, the challenge of the Abu Sayyaf, and it's, we will continue uh, to, uh, to work with the United States in terms of uh, interoperability uh, and joint exercises. Uh, we are, after all, a treaty ally, so that will continue. Uh, now, with regards to the SAVE Act, uh, I think that uh, uh, we are uh, doing an all-court press, uh, mid in, uh, in in Congress. Uh, I think we must have seen uh, better than, uh, I don't know, I have, I have at least uh, a dozen uh, senators and congressmen on the list that I have to see after having seen uh, maybe that many already. So uh, we did succeed in getting Senator Inouye to refile uh, the bill yesterday. And for example, uh, we were able to get John McCain on board. He's the, he, he will be a, a sponsor, uh, co-sponsor, I think. But he said yes. It's not sure to what extent. He said yes. We will. I will be part of that. So we are. We're doing what we can. And I'm not sure that uh, ASEAN uh, is uh, should be uh, should be enlisted in this effort. I think this is a, a bilateral issue, and uh, we should try to do this ourselves. Two dozen meetings on the Hill, Ambassador Quisha. You really are. Uh, you, you welcome to Washington, by the way. <laughs> Amazing job. Uh, let me uh, go to the back, and I see Al Santoli back. Okay. Hello, Mr. Secretary. Welcome back to Washington. Thank you. And thank you, Ernie, for uh, another great meeting. Um, one of the issues that, um, besides the South China Sea and uh, the natural resources of the maritime, including energy, is food and water security. I mean, right now, Manila's flooded. Cotabato is under quite a bit of water. Um, and uh, down in the south, there wasn't a dry season this year. And last, last year, the, the traditional rice belt up in um, the Cagayan Valley <coughs> was pretty much devastated. Um, what is the foreign ministry's role in terms of trade relations as there's countries from outside of the Philippines and outside of the region even, such as the Arab countries who are running out of food and water, China, Korea, are coming in to be able to, to form business deals and leasing large tracts of land or attempting to lease large tracts of land uh, to protect the Filipinos uh, in Bukidnon, we saw that um, the old Del Monte area, the Filipinos are going hungry while the food is going to China. What can be done to be able to protect the well-being of Filipinos while the agricultural trade uh, moves forward? Uh, we, we have, we have uh, uh, a, uh, programs to uh, address uh, these issues that, uh, uh, that you mentioned, Al. Uh, not only in the, on a bilateral basis, but on a multilateral basis, uh, which we do with ASEAN. Uh, we, we do have uh, uh, programs uh, to address the food, uh, water, and energy security uh, situation that uh, is facing uh, the ASEAN uh, countries. And uh, we're looking into uh, various areas of cooperation and best practices uh, on how we may be able to address these challenges. Um, I'm not sure what the other question was. I think you had two questions. Uh, protecting, protecting the Filipinos when other countries are leasing large tracts of agricultural land so that, that there is food sustainability and uh, security. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, I think, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to get back to you. Uh, but uh, for example, in terms of uh, 
uh, I, I, something came to mind when you were asking me that question. Uh, uh, one of the problems of food security uh, that, that accentuates itself uh, when you have disasters. No? And uh, we have a program in ASEAN uh, where uh, we will be storing uh, uh, food, uh, be it rice or whatever staple food, uh, precisely to respond to, uh, to areas of disaster when, uh, when, uh, as the time uh, requires. No? Uh, Paul uh, thank you. Paul Eckert of the Reuters News Agency. In your opening remarks to us, you uh, said that you do not want the United States to fight your battles, but you, all, but you wanted certain kinds of defense help and other help. Um, also, you'll be meeting uh, Secretary Clinton later today, and uh, I'm wondering, especially as a treaty ally, what sort of... Uh, more concretely, what do you, what are you going to ask of the United States in this South China Sea? Uh, what sort of concrete follow-up do you want from Secretary Clinton's remarks a year ago in Hanoi? Well, I think I think that uh, the the problem in the South China Sea is a uh, it's not just a Philippine problem. Uh, I I think that uh, if I can recall what was said in uh, Hanoi, and again. Uh, uh, said again in interventions uh, in the uh, in the uh, ministers' meeting uh, recently uh, for a ARF, I believe uh, there were some. Uh, I think uh, we we do agree with the United States when it stated that uh, 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 maritime uh, uh, mar maritime uh, security is is uh, is essential. It's uh, and when you have uh, intrusions, uh, uh, you must uh, think about the possibility that uh, freedom of navigation is uh, is being threatened, and uh, you you really should look for diplomatic ways in a, in order to solve the the uh, the the, uh, the disputed area situ uh, problems, and uh, you should uh, look to international law. Uh, for the solution, and uh, you should proceed uh, uh, as fast as you can in terms of finalizing and making concrete the DOC and COC, uh, uh, the code of conduct that, that uh, remains out there and has not been finalized. Uh, I think the, the, the problem of, uh, of uh, as I said, uh, repeating myself, uh, uh, maritime security is, is it's our problem, but it's also your problem. Are you follow up on that? Okay. I think it's important. Um, there's been talk in the media, at least, of, of the U.S. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Nelson butting in again. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, there's been talk in the media that there may well there may be a question of consulting with the U.S. on the mutual defense treaty when it comes to events in the South China Sea. I think what you've said a couple of times today would certainly lead to that question. Uh, are, you, are you thinking about talking about con consulting us under the Mutual Defense Treaty? Uh, what would it take, do you think, to get to that point? Uh, uh, are we getting close to it? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think it's a, it's a good question to ask. Uh, if you were in my place, uh, I think uh, you would consider asking that question. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what the answer would be, but uh, I can tell you what the circumstances uh, surrounding that uh, have been in the past. Uh, we do have a mutual defense treaty. Uh, we, we do have uh, some evidence on uh, what exactly is covered. And as a matter of fact, we have uh, Ambassador Hubbard here, uh, who is responsible for, <laughs> for clarifying that uh, the, the Pacific area doesn't mean the Pacific Ocean. It means uh, the, the, the areas surrounding the Pacific, which encompasses the South China Sea. Greg. Yeah, thank you. I was afraid Chris uh, Nelson would ask all of my questions <laughs> first. Um, uh, uh, on, on, uh, I'm Greg Rushford uh, from the Rushford Report. Uh, on the South China Sea issue, uh, does the Philippines have any plans to upgrade its navy, uh, buying more boats or whatever, or helicopters? And on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 
I may have misunderstood your reference to that having been a closed organization because I believe at the initiative of Singapore and New Zealand and others that the United States and Vietnam were welcome to uh, negotiate to join the TPP and the Philippines before you assumed office declined. Uh, if that's true, it, it's hard to see any advantage for, for the Philippines when Vietnam and even the United States are going to join or, or likely to join. With regards to your first question, uh, Greg, um, uh, yes, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, trying to upgrade our Navy. Uh, the President has uh, set aside a uh, what to us is a significant amount of money, 11 billion pesos, uh, to see what can be done for an upgrade. Uh, but uh, I, I was at the Washington Post earlier, okay, so let me share t with you what, uh, what uh, I had said there. Anyway, you're going to read about it tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> we, are, uh, we are looking for, uh, as I said, uh, some new way, for some new ways to do things that uh, we had been doing in the past. And uh, for example, the, the, uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, resorting to uh, excess defense articles to be able to upgrade our, our military capabilities is, uh, has served us well in the past. Uh, but we think that uh, we should be thinking of uh, another way to do it. Uh, uh, what, what, what seems to have happened, and, and we're, we're accustomed to this already because we've, we've, we've been the beneficiaries of, uh, of this program for so many years, uh, they try to look for, uh, for uh, assets that can be uh, reconditioned. We take them out of uh, inventory. And then uh, it takes uh, months, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half to recondition this. And the cost of reconditioning comes out of our FMF. Uh, very expensive. Uh, and then uh, if you have, it's like buying a used car. Uh, if you talk to Senator Inouye, he will, he will create a great analogy for you. He says, uh, you know, uh, the reconditioning doesn't last very long. Uh, you know, you, at some point in time, you have uh, great maintenance uh, challenges in terms of that particular asset. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, we obviously need to, uh, uh, to refleet, refleet quickly uh, and uh, more thoughtfully and uh, more cost effectively. And uh, we're looking for, I, I made a suggestion at, at the uh, interview with the uh, editors of uh, Washington Post today that what we'd like to see is uh, the possibility maybe of an operational lease uh, so that we can look at uh, fairly new equipment and be able to get our hands on that quickly. Uh, I, think, I think we need to have the resources to be able to stand and defend ourselves. And I think to the extent that we can do that, uh, we become a stronger ally for you. The lady in the back. Hi, Mr. Secretary. Welcome back to Washington, D.C. My name is Silvana Chan, and I'm representing the Human Rights Watch. And I have two questions. The first one, has the U.S. raised concerns with you during your time here about the ongoing extrajudicial killings and impunity for these abuses? How has U.S. diplomacy influenced Philippine government policy and practice regarding human rights and particularly accountability for military abuses? My second question, the Philippines sees itself as a human rights leader in Southeast Asia. Why is the Philippines not leading the region in pushing for a commission of inquiry into war crimes and crimes against humanity in Burma when such a commission would help, as Aung San Suu Kyi has said, to find out what human rights violations have taken place and what we can do to ensure that such violations do not take place in the future. Thank you. Yeah, th those are essentially two questions, right? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, as far as the Philippine record for uh, human rights is concerned, we're, we're endeavoring to do what we can in order to, uh, to develop a, a climate that uh, obviously promotes uh, that. Uh, as you know, our president, uh, uh, President uh, Aquino's father, uh, was a victim of uh, extrajudicial killing. Uh, and so uh, he, he, he knows and appreciates what needs to be done. 
For example, you speak of uh, the military abuses. Uh, uh, I just uh, looked at uh, my notes uh, before I came here, and I saw that the, uh, we have an anti-torture law and the enabling, uh, enabling um, uh, uh, documents, uh, the implementing rules and regulations uh, are being finalized as we speak. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, of the problem in uh, in uh, Burma uh, in Myanmar, um, I think you're speaking of uh, of uh, the the due diligence. Uh, to me, it looks like a due diligence of uh, of uh, human rights violations there. Um, it's I, I think we're we're not clear yet what uh, what uh, how we want to how we want to side with that issue. Uh, my thinking is that uh, there is a democratization, uh, quote unquote, process that's uh, being uh, undertaken in uh, in uh, Myanmar. Uh, they've had elections, uh, and we've we've stood up in uh, when we can and as often as we can to say that this, this democratiz democratization process should be more inclusive, uh, and that, uh, for example, there. Are 2,100 political pr prisoners there, and those prisoners, uh, to begin with, should be released. Uh, but we think that that's a very young democracy if, if they're headed to, towards democracy, and we should give them a chance. Uh, I, I think that this, uh, this audit, uh, it's due diligence audit, or whatever you call it, uh, you may be seeing too many people who are looking backwards and not enough who are looking forwards. Uh, that's my concern. Hi, I'm Marianne from um, George Washington University, grad student. You mentioned your speech about um, your office priority to also ensure the welfare of Filipinos abroad, and you mentioned the number of Filipinos here in the U.S. I don't know if you have read already, but um, Mr. Jose Antonio Vargas, New York Times reporter, released an article in New York Times regarding his story regarding uh, being an illegal immigrant or undocumented immigrant in the U.S., so I don't know if you have read that, and if you have, could I get your reaction to it? And second, I also would like to know if your office or the Philippine government in general is, has expressed interest in helping um, Mr. Vargas in his situation, and another question to that is, as we know, Mr. Vargas' situation is not unique. We also have um, teachers in Prince George's County in Maryland who are, risk, are losing their jobs who are Filipinos also. So in general, is immigration also a priority of your office, aside from um, economic and security issues? Thank you. Uh, I have not read that article. Um, but uh, if uh, the, the embassy is in a position to help, uh, it would be our responsibility to do that. Uh, as you know, uh, we, have, uh, we have assistance to nationals uh, focus. Uh, uh, when, uh, as, as peop for example, as uh, our people are apprehended all over the world, and it's our job to make sure that uh, that person is uh, treated fairly, that he has uh, uh, legal representation, and uh, if there is a conviction, uh, then we work for uh, for a uh, for a, we appeal uh, for for uh, for him. So uh, we do have uh, we do have. Uh, uh, assistance to national programs in place, and we do take care of our our uh, our overseas Filipinos. Believe me, uh, it was barely 36 hours, and I was already in Libya, uh, trying to get those uh, uh, Filipinos out there. Who uh, uh, initially we had 500 out, and then uh, we came back, and uh, the situation had improved. They didn't they didn't want to come out, and then days later it got worse. They wanted to come out, so we had to go back in there again. You know. We, uh, th that's our job, okay, <laughs> and we do that. Well, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I'd ask all my colleagues uh, to join me in thanking you for an outstanding speech. And <laughs>